Public television stations, by the Stroh Brewery Company, family brewers for over 200 years, and by the makers of Soloflex. Good evening, friends. Welcome to Late Night America. Later in the program, we're going to take a look at the traits of a healthy family. They include qualities like a sense of humor and the ability to listen. Right now, we're going to talk about Africa. It's a continent four times as big as America, composed of 51 nations with 500 million people. Contrary to popular opinion, Africa, according to our guest, is not sliding into a nightmare of despair, and Africans are faring much better than we give them credit for. Our guest is Remer Tyson. He's just back from three years in Africa. He set up the first African bureau for the Detroit Free Press. He's now that paper's national and foreign editor. It's good to have you here. It's good to be here. I enjoyed many, many of your columns of when you were overseas. It seemed to be a terrific, terrific assignment. It's the best time of my life. It's the, the, the toughest, best job in the world. Is that right? Yeah. What prompted the Free Press to set up a bureau over there? Um, the Detroit Free Press is owned by Knight Ritter Newspapers, and about five years ago they started setting up a foreign service, and uh, an African bureau was one of the early ones, and they asked me to go and open the bureau in Harare, Zimbabwe. Since then, uh, we've opened another bureau, a uh, Philadelphia Inquirer in uh, Nairobi. The bureaus are up to 16 or 20 by now all is over the world. Right? Yeah. Why was uh, why they pick Zimbabwe? Because uh, that's where the best story is in Southern Africa. Uh, we had initially anticipated opening a bureau in Nairobi, but Nairobi is uh, about 1,500 miles north of, uh, of South Africa and Harare. Uh, the conflict in South Africa, the uh, development along the front line stage from Mozambique to Angola, uh, it's where the action is. And so we decided to put a, the bureau there because uh, now that Zimbabwe is independent, you can file from there. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful country, pleasant place to live, uh, and a good place to uh, work out of. How is an, uh, is an American journalist treated over there? Oh, they love us. Yeah? Yeah, they, they really, they, if, if, if sometimes that the, uh, the political rhetoric is uh, anti-American, but Africans uh, uh, who don't know much about Americans, they somehow know, see us, uh, as uh, people who, 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 who were colonized by the British, fought the British off, they identify with us. We wrote a constitution that we haven't lived up to, but nevertheless, the words are there. We uh, never um, had any uh, colonizing influence uh, in the early days in Africa. Now, it's, uh, it's, uh, they began to look at us a little different because of the Reagan administration. But um, if you're an American, uh, Africans will, um, uh, will like you. If you have a problem, uh, I found it worked many times to say, look, I'm an American. I don't know how things work. And they seem to, you know, identify with Americans don't know how to do much of anything, and they would help you take into your homes. So. A couple of uh, things just pop out of my mind as some of your recent articles. Uh, you're talking about Ethiopia and talking about the, uh, the just the warmth and uh, that people just, it's a part of a tradition, I think, that just anybody who shows up at the house will be taken care of, huh? Yes, greatest hospitality in the world. They're, they're beautiful people. Uh, uh, it, that is a, a, a country of, of great turmoil uh, uh, politically and otherwise. Um, uh, probably the poorest country in the world, even I think Ethiopia is probably poorer than Bangladesh. It was amazing to me to read a sentence in one of your uh, reports that said that three quarters of the population of Ethiopia was a day's walk away from a road? That's right. That's mind boggling. That's 40 million people too. The, the um, you know, just trippingly off the tongue as I, you know, introduced our conversation here, I, I say 51 nations, uh, I say uh, 500 million people. Uh, I, Outside, uh, a lot of people just look at Africa as one place, right? One country or something like that. But Clark, if you put a little map up on the screen, you can just get a, a, a feeling of, I mean, Lord, four times the United States. Size well, the United States. They have a desert there in Sahara, which is as big as the United States. Is that right? Yeah. Absolutely. And to think that so many of these uh, countries, the independents, 
has come what in the 1950s the 1960s the, uh, the first it was gone in 1957 and uh, uh, then there was a whole wave uh, uh, in the early 60s and Zimbabwe which was independent became independent in uh, April 1980 was is the latest country to gain independence so uh, and there's uh, it's it's of course that sort of change brought overwhelming problems and turmoil jockeying for, for positions uh, political instability famine uh, but when uh, change comes that quickly that's uh, those are the kinds of things you can expect what one of the problems they have also is that that there, there was a perception in the 50s and 60s if only African countries could, could become independent and free that they were they could do super things the truth of the matter, Africans are just like me and you. They're capable of doing uh, all the things, but they aren't super people. And it's, it's switched around now where people are saying, well, there are all these failures and, uh, and Africa is going down the drain. Um, I think that's an overstatement within itself. Uh, there are a lot of problems, and it's going to take a long time, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an awful change in, uh, in such a short period of time. I'm going to throw out uh, in, in succession uh, five words that I picked up out of your writing. And uh, as I throw out a word, just free associate to any scene that, that might stick in your mind back from uh, the time you spent in, uh, in Africa. Uh, chaotic. Uh, Lagos. Okay. And, and what would, how would that show itself? Well, Lagos is, which I enjoy and respect the people, well, I enjoyed it for a short period of time. Uh, but Lagos is a, it was a city of a few hundred thousand people um, a few years ago. They had the oil boom. There's uh, maybe 10 million people there now. They have no sewer system. They have no, the water doesn't work. The power doesn't work. Uh, um, they don't pick up the garbage. Um, uh, there are dead bodies all over the place. Uh, nobody bothers about that. Dead bodies, uh, humans, horses, whatever. Um, it's an assault upon uh, all your senses, uh, sight, hearing, uh, smell, uh, but nevertheless the, the Nigerians are, are very energetic people, they're traders, they don't produce things. They get up every morning and try to trade something and uh, when they trade they want to make a profit at it. Um, beauty. Oh, mana pools. Mana pools and uh, vamba. Now, what are those words to me? Uh, Mana Pools is, uh, is a game preserve where uh, uh, you can go and you can, it was almost like the in the beginning um, uh, Garden of Eden where animals and humans were together and they had to respect one another and uh, actually the human had to give to the, the power of the beast. The, um, it's uh, maybe a half a million acres and, and one of the most beautiful places. Other is Vumba is a mountain area on the eastern Zimbabwe highlands overlooking the Mozambique border. It's probably the most beautiful place in the world. How about violence? Uh, South Africa. It's hard to imagine a country of uh, 29 million, 80 percent black, and uh, no representation. Johannesburg, uh, residential for whites only. Uh, we've been reading in the newspaper for the past few days about the violence there. Uh, the new legislature that's including some of the uh, Indians, some of the quote-unquote coloreds. Uh, Lord, the frustration on the part of the blacks there must be just, I, I mean, I can't think of the right word, huh? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's very high. The, the, the frustration and the depression and deprivation is, is great and that there's not enough time for uh, for you and I to sort that out at all. It's such a complex, devastating situation which is uh, not going to change very much, I think, in, in, uh, in a short time. The, uh, the South Africans are willing to give on almost everything but one, and that is uh, giving up political power for the white Africana, which mm -hmm. is now in control. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are about uh, trying to uh, create a situation where they can maintain power under uh, the best of circumstances for themselves. Soweto, 20 to a room, in some oh, cases? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, you can't believe Soweto. Soweto's got more people in it than Detroit. <coughs> I mean, it's bigger than Johannesburg. Um, uh, it's just an area mostly of, uh, of uh, we wouldn't even call them shotgun houses here, small houses. Uh, uh, most of the people there live there illegally. That's the reason, and they uh, all go out in the daytime, and uh, they come in at night, and they have to have somewhere to sleep. I mean, for instance, uh, 
on a kitchen they would move the tables and the chairs outside so they can all uh, hmm. lie on the floor or maybe they'd leave the table so that they could sleep under the table and on top of the table. Quiet strength. You use that phrase. Well, it's, uh, it's, it's something that seems like the African has preserved that we've lost. Or maybe we never had it and we were such a hustle and bustle. But you see so many times that things can be bad, uh, things can be going wrong, or, or maybe uh, or Westerners are trying to get something done, produced. The, uh, maybe not much is happening, but the African has that quite strength and something to be admired. I've seen it among uh, friends uh, of mine in this country who are black. Uh, Julian Bond has it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, uh, I, I see that a lot, and it's, uh, it's an admirable trait. 313 in Detroit is our telephone number. 313-872-4040. Our guest is Reamer Tyson. He is now the national and foreign editor of the Detroit Free Press, and we've said on this program before, one of the most respected newspapers in the country. I'm sure it ranks in the top 10 or 15. Uh, Reamer has just spent three years in Africa, set up the bureau there for the free press, and uh, I told him right before we sat down for our conversation that you would have many, many, many good questions on tonight's topic. I think it's just an absolute terrific learning experience for all of us who know so little about Africa, the continent, 51 nations, 500 million people, and this is just an opportunity to uh, take advantage of uh, Reamer's expertise and his, uh, his living there and working in there. Uh, in that atmosphere, in that country, in those countries, for such a short, uh, for a long period of time, but we're going to have a short period with them tonight. So keep it tight. Three one three eight seven two four zero four zero. You say over there, uh, time has a different meaning, huh? Uh, <coughs> yes, the um, uh, the Africans have time to um, deal with things that they consider important, and uh, production isn't necessarily one of those things. So uh, it's. Um, it's talking, it's getting to know people, it's to have people in their homes, it's to treat people uh, civilly. Uh, we don't do that a lot over here sometimes. We have some photographs that you brought with you tonight, uh, just uh, six or eight photographs with uh, uh, just a, a nice comfortable feel. We want to put them up on the screen and just give us a little bit of a flavor of each one. Clark, can you show those for us? That's Gambier. That's a stilt city that uh, in Benin, where the Africans built uh, houses on uh, over a lagoon to avoid paying the land tax. This is a quietness into that. This is a tea plantation in Kenya. Uh, the women you see in the background are picking. Uh, it's uh, India. Uh, the Kenya tea is the best uh, tea in the world and also the highest priced. And this is. Uh, a uh, salesman outside of a hotel in Otakami, uh, Togo. Uh, he actually s says there's no mask in Togo. That mask is from Zaire. Mm. Looks a little like him, though. Yeah. And he's, he was a very friendly guy. Uh, these are uh, women who are s selling in the market in Lome, Togo. It's probably the one or maybe the best market in Africa, and certainly if you want to see Africa, you should go to Togo there, have good hotels and respectable. These are the Elijah ones, the parents of the basketball player who was uh, All-American at University of Houston and now plays with, uh, has signed with the Houston team. Uh, they're from uh, Lagos, Nigeria. Beautiful people. Uh, this is a parade for President Moy when he announced for re-election last year in Kenya. Um, the uh, headdress, uh, the headsets that they are wearing are from a Columbus monkeys, which are fairly scarce in Kenya and the rest of Africa. These are uh, hippos that uh, crawl down for a long period, of, a long space to photograph on the Zambezi River in uh, northern Zimbabwe. Across the way there, you'd be seeing Zambia. This is an uh, elephant in. Uh, Mana pools that I was telling mm -hmm. you about. As a matter of fact, he's actually charging us. Ah, you uh, you spent some time in in, in the bush. Uh, that's what they call it, right? In the yeah. bush, uh, and you camped out. And what was that? Was, is that is that a little frightening? Uh, well, it can threatening. You talk about lions. You talk about uh, elephants. You talk about. Well, it can. It's. Uh, it wasn't frightening to me. It was very pleasant. Uh, it can be frightening. And we had an elephant come into the camp within about 20 feet and was eating. Uh, 
Uh, I went with someone who had been in the Army there during the war who knew the game, knew the area. Uh, you can get hurt there very easily. As a matter of fact, the last six months I was there, there was one or uh, two people killed and a little girl was picked up by a line and her, her spine was snapped. It's, uh, if you don't do anything foolish, it can be very enjoyable. You say to know Africa, you must know Nigeria. What's going on in Nigeria? Well, it's by far the largest country there, uh, one out of every four. Uh, African is a Nigerian. There's 100, uh, 150 million people. It's an aggressive country. It has great oil wealth. It has uh, good agricultural production. Uh, when they want to, they put it aside. Now they're importing uh, a good deal of food. But uh, because of its size and because of the, of the self-confidence of the Nigerians, um, uh, you have to know about that country because the future of Africa is going to be dictated, uh, if not dictated, influenced in a large way by Nigeria. You know, the uh, British were never able to, to really colonize Nigeria. They call it the white man's grave, and if you go there, you'll understand why. Rima Tyson is our guest. He is now the national and foreign editor of the Detroit Free Press, just back from three years in Africa. Your phone call is coming up next on Late Night America. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Dennis, I'm calling from Atlanta, Georgia. Good to have you with us. What's your name? My name is Gurma. Good to have you with us. Go ahead. I'm from Ethiopia. Thank you. I just heard your, your guest talking about Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. and in general, for African countries, where there is superpower fighting each other to control the whole world, it will be difficult for African nations to develop their countries. What did you think about that, the two superpowers, especially the U.S. and the Russian, are fighting each other to control the whole African continent. How did you think about that since you had a chance to get over there and see? Okay, thank you. You have uh, a situation in Ethiopia where the Americans uh, were in favor there until a few years ago, about five years ago, and then uh, the, um, there was a revolution in Ethiopia and it is now aligned with the Russians. Uh, I find the, th that the east-west conflict in Africa to be grossly overrated. Uh, the Africans uh, have just thrown off uh, colonial powers. The last thing they want is another superpower to dictate to them. But uh, in their times of need, they sometimes turn to one or the other for weapons or for food or for whatever because uh, that's the only place they can get it. And it's often like a drowning man. He'll grasp at a straw. Hi there. You're on Late Night America. Hello, Dennis. My yep. name is Carolyn, and I'm from Texas. Hi there. And my question for Mr. Tyson is, I noticed he says that the different bureaus that had sprung up there in Africa recently, I was wondering, what uh, did they have any black Americans there, and what type of perspective, or did they share that with him, did they have being in South Africa? Well, we missed we one word. We, we missed one word that you said, the different type of what's there? Uh, what type of perspective did they have on the country? Uh, what were their feelings being there in South Africa? The black Americans? Uh, you're talking about black Americans? Yes. Okay. Well, well black Americans, uh, I found uh, very much opposed to the South African system of apartheid. Uh, black Africans, uh, black Americans uh, in Africa sometimes have uh, quite a hard time because it's uh, um, Africans tend to see uh, white and black Americans uh, uh, in the same way quite often, and that's very difficult for black Americans to adjust to sometimes. How, how, how do you mean to see them? See them? Uh, what is the perspective? Well, I mean, if uh, you go there, they see you as an American, and if as a black American goes there, they tend to see him as an American also. Yeah. And that uh, black Americans so quite frequently think that uh, it ought to be different. How would they want it? Well, I think they like to see them, uh, they see themselves much more as brothers and sisters, and uh, when it turns out that uh, they're viewed as Americans, that's uh, something with disappointment to them. Okay, I was having a little trouble following that. Hi there, you're on Late Night America? Yes, yeah, so if you could pick up, my name is Mike from Omaha, Illinois. Good, Mike. 
And uh, I was wondering if, if uh, Mr. Tyson could tell me the fastest growing religious movement in Africa right now. Uh, I think it's the Muslim movement. Okay. It's across North Africa. Okay, thank you. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Hello, are you there? Yes. All right, go ahead, you're on the air. Yes, my name is Eleanor, I'm from Indianapolis. And I have relatives who live in South Africa in the white corridor between the cis guy and the trans guy. I visited over there about a year and a half ago, and the talk at that time of the South Africans is that the homelands that are recognized as countries by South Africa may come back into the country within 15 to 20 years as a confederation of states, and this may be the only way that the blacks are going to gain any kind of power in the government. Have you um, talked with anyone who is anything like this? Uh, what are your feelings on this? Explain the homeland business. Well, the uh, South Africa uh, created a system, a homeland system, but they, uh, they said that there's 70% of the country which is black, 72% of the country is black. They set aside 13% of the, the country uh, for, uh, to give to them as homelands, and they said these will be separate countries, like Botswana is supposed to be a country the same as the United States. Um, only South Africa recognizes that. Um, and the theory was, was that if you created the homelands, that eventually there would be parts of South Africa that was only, that was all white. And uh, that part, therefore, there'd be no discrimination uh, because uh, it'd be all white. Uh, that hasn't worked very well, but I haven't seen any indication that the South Africans uh, plan to reincorporate uh, re the homelands into the whole country as far as policy is concerned. As far as most of the world is concerned, it's never happened anyway. Uh, can, you, can you tell me a little bit about this? And I know it might be a little subtle, but it interests me. This idea of uh, the creation of a black middle class uh, giving uh, some uh, blacks education and jobs to kind of get them voting on the side of the whites or sympathetic uh, so they won't lose what they get and therefore that they can kind of control the situation in that way? Well, I'll have to do it with mathematics and that's yeah. the only way. The whites are about five million in South Africa. Mm -hmm. They hope to, with this new parliament they're having, this integrated parliament, uh, they hope to be able to bring in about two and a half million coloreds, that's people mixed race, another 800,000 Asians. That means they still got to have about eight million blacks to help them. And that would leave another um, 12 to 14 million blacks in opposition. Uh, so if uh, their, I think their hope is that if somehow they can create a black middle class that has a stake in that system um, and would be opposed to bringing it down as black revolutionaries want to do, that that's their hope. The uh, Afrikaner is a very practical person. He'll do whatever he can to stay in power. Is it uh, A, doable, and B, is it the moral thing to do? Neither. Elaborate, please. Well, I don't think it's doable. It, uh, I don't think you can create enough of a, of a, of a black middle class to save the, uh, um, the white government. Uh, I don't think the um, South African system is moral. Should 350 American companies be doing business over there? That's the question I wanted to ask you since uh, I knew you were coming. Well, uh, the only time there's ever been any change in South Africa is when uh, investment started leaving the country in uh, 1976 after the Soweto riots. I think that's the answer for it. If uh, the companies, uh, there's, this is a long, involved, complicated argument, but if the change would happen in that country quicker than anything else at, if those companies were not doing business there. There is an awesome argument on the other side that the blacks would pay for it in the short run very heavily. Question is on the table. Should 350 American companies be doing business there? Well, that's their decision, not mine. That I can lay out the, uh, uh, the, the choices for you. I wouldn't do business there. Okay. From what you've seen, when we listen to debates on South Africa, whereas, where the companies will say that they're making a contribution uh, through jobs, through helping the economy, uh, is that... Uh, I just want to know if all this business over there is moral. 
that's that's a, a question that is, has so many. Yeah, but you've seen there. You've lived there. You've 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 seen it. Yeah, I've seen it, and I've seen that Ford Motor Company and General Motors are of all the companies are more progressive than anybody else, mm -hmm. and they're trying to do more than they've been permitted to do. Mm -hmm. At the same time, their influence on the economy sustains the government as it is now. Uh, if uh, Ford Motor Company and uh, GM was not, were, should leave tomorrow, there would be thousands of people out of jobs. Uh, is it moral to suggest, sustain an immoral situation, or is it moral to leave people uh, without jobs? It, as, as I told you in the beginning, it, this situation in South Africa is so complex that there's, there are not clear-cut answers yes and no. Uh, uh, I have some personal answers, but I think those are, are, are uh, of very narrow answers. But your question is, is it, is it moral to sub sustain an immoral situation, I think speaks for itself. Hi there, you're on Late Night America? Yes, uh, Richard from Goddridge, Ontario. Hi, Dennis. Hi there. Um, I'd like to, I, it's very much in line with the discussion at this point. Um, I was going to ask uh, Mr. Tyson, what uh, structures actually uh, are in place in South Africa, political structures, that keep the white in power? Are they similar, in the second, uh, I, I, I suppose the second question, are they similar to political structures that were in place in the United States uh, when slavery uh, here was in its heyday? Um, I don't know, I guess it gets pretty subtle, but uh, really the question then is, uh, can they be changed quickly? Uh, could they be changed within the next 25, 30 years? And only by revolutions, a lot of questions maybe. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be difficult to change it that quickly. Uh, of course, it, I'm always aware that uh, sometime when change starts to happen, it goes over the edge very quickly, so I don't rule that out. Um, but the, um, the government there is very strong. The, um, the bulwark of the apartheid system is, is basically two things. Is, uh, it forbids uh, marriage between um, people of different races, and it's uh, assigning people to group areas. Um, for instance, uh, if someone is, uh, is is black and uh, and Asian, they can't uh, they can't get married. Therefore, uh, and anybody who's Asian has to live in one area, black in another area. One of the consequences of that, sometime uh, an Asian uh, wants to marry a colored, that one of them becomes a colored or an Asian, and then they can move into the same group area. But as long as you have uh, laws that ban mixed marriages and assign people to group areas and deprive uh, 85, uh, about 85 percent of the population of all uh, civil, political, and ownership rights. Uh, that's a that's a system that sustains itself very well, and of course it's it's backed up by uh, by uh, police power, security forces. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Yes, my name is Nada from Westbury, New York. I noticed that nothing has been mentioned thus far in relation uh, in reference to Tanzania. I want to know whether or not you visited there, and if you could briefly give me your opinion of the relationship between the United States and Tanzania, and why. No, I didn't visit Tanzania. I kept meaning to get there. I was in 25 or 30 countries, and I just ran out of time, and uh, I didn't go to Tanzania for one reason, is I just didn't want to write about another African failure. Uh, the, I think that uh, it's a uh, the relationship between the U.S. and Tanzania is strained at some time, but I don't think it's uh, uh, particularly stressful at this time. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. I don't agree with that. I um, have friends who are living there now, and I understand the relationship between the U.S. and Nereri, particularly the president of Tanzania, is very strained at this point. There is nothing in the newspapers at this point about the subject, and in fact, there seems to be a closed door lack of communication between the two countries at this point. Well, we have diplomatic relations. We uh, had uh, uh, Ambassador Miller, who was there and just gone to Zimbabwe. Uh, I think he was very successful. Um, um, I, I don't think that the relationships are, are as bad as they have been in the past. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Yes, I'm Adam from Virginia, and my question involves U.S. aid to Africa. I'd like to know what could be done to ensure that U.S. aid money to these countries can get to the people it's supposed to get to. In Ethiopia, for example, the food that we gave to the Ethiopian government was sold by the Ethiopian government to enable to buy arms. 
I'm wondering what can the government of our country do to prevent this from happening? Uh, that's always a problem all over the world. I'll, I'll just give you another example on the other side of Ethiopia. When um, uh, we sent uh, food aid to southern Zimbabwe, the, at that time the government had uh, cordoned off that area of the country. Uh, we said, if you don't send food to everybody, you don't get the food. They sent the food there. They got $11 million worth of food. I think that's the way you can do it. Okay. We uh, want to thank Reamer Tyson for being with us uh, this evening. He is now the national and foreign editor of the Detroit Free Press. And if you just joined us as we were going along, uh, Reamer Tyson went over to uh, Africa in uh, 81, I think it was, spent three years there, set up the Bureau for the Free Press and the Knight Redder newspapers. And uh, he's back now. And uh, it was awfully good to have you here. Thank you for going over there. And we were privileged to have you there and uh, reading your columns as, uh, over the last three years. Thank you. It's a privilege to be there. OK. We're going to take a little break, friends. When we come back on the other side, we're going to talk about the traits of a healthy family. You can check your family out against those good traits. Friday, car and driver publisher David E. Davis previews next year's new car models and a visit with Muppet music man Jeff Moss. Monday, political economist Elliot Janeway on how the economy will affect this year's elections and divorce lawyer to the stars Marvin Mitchelson. Then on Tuesday, journalist Stanley Carno with his award-winning account of the Vietnam War, Vietnam, a history, plus how computers play a role in shaping the presidency. Our guests surveyed 500 family specialists to find out what healthy families have in common. She found out the American family is alive and well, very well, and about 15 traits seem to come up often. We're going to talk about those. Our guest is Dolores Curran. Her column, a Talk with Parents, is in about 85 newspapers around the country. Her book, Traits of a Healthy Family, now in paperback, and there's all kinds of good information in there. Good to have you here. Thank you so much. Uh, American Family, not disintegrating? No, not disintegrating. Big myth. Big myth. Uh, are you saying that the media is focused on all the bad? Well, I think it's natural, but I think another thing is that, that we... It has become kind of a national attitude, and families buy into it. It's a little bit like telling a child long enough that he's weak or a failure, and he starts believing it, and the American mm -hmm. family's done the same. You kind of say that uh, it's better than it was a generation ago. Mm -hmm. huh? People communicate better? Well, no. not Yes, well, surely they do. But one of the other things is a generation ago, one of the traits of a healthy family was you hid your problems. So we came out with this myth that families were so good a generation ago. And they weren't all that good. They hid their alcoholics. They hid their marital problems. Uh, today, the healthier the family, the sooner it goes public with its problems. It tries to get its alcoholic to say, I'm an alcoholic publicly. Right. And so you're saying that, uh, that all families have problems, and, but the healthy ones seem to recognize the problem, even anticipate that there are going to be problems. Exactly. The healthy family uh, doesn't equate 
good family with perfect family. Mm -hmm. That whole perfectionism. So unhealthy or at least not so healthy families tend to say, we've got a problem, we failed. Okay. Healthy families say, we've got a problem, we're normal. Now let's ah. look at what our strengths are. Let's bring them up and use them to deal with our stresses. You said something, when you just used the word perfectionism, it triggered off the thought in my mind that you had said that rigidity and perfectionism destroy more marriages, oh, huh? It really is sad um, that, that people who, who expect to be the perfect mother, the perfect wife, the perfect husband, the perfectly successful provider, and then something comes in to upset that, uh, in healthy families, it's just saying, oh, okay, so we deal with this the way it is. It's not that we failed, that's the way life is. Okay, but now where does this whole business of the high divorce rate fit in? Because we're talking one out of three, we're talking some areas one out of two. You're right, but we're also the most remarrying society in the world. Mm -hmm. And so people are still looking for what for happy and healthy families they're trying again if it, and another thing is where we realize now that a lot of people did not divorce in earlier years because it was a stigma mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they stayed in unhappy marriages we're demanding more out of marriage today than we ever have before we're demanding intimacy and meaning to life and relationship and even though people might have success and beautiful homes and good jobs if they aren't finding intimacy if they're lonely in their marriage they're getting out mm -hmm. and who's to say that that's uh, a more negative response than staying in it. We could debate that one for the next half hour. That's right. Um, you say that it's not economic survival. That's not what not the family anymore. is all about. Well, people aren't marrying anymore to be fed and cared for what the way they did once. A woman had to get married and actually to live an economic life that was reasonable. Um, it, it, today, a woman who is married and a woman who is unmarried with the same job, guess which one has the higher economic lifestyle the single woman yeah okay. and so no longer does a, is a woman forced and pressured to get married in order to be um, to survive economically a man doesn't have to be married anymore if he doesn't want to be with to be cared for he has McDonald's he has <laughs> the laundromats he even has more permissive sex outside of marriage so why are people marrying they're marrying because of the need for intimacy, to give and be given to, to care and be cared for, to overcome loneliness, to risk vulnerabilities with one another. And we're in kindergarten with that. We know how to work and we know how mm -hmm. to housekeep, but we don't know how to be intimate. Okay, let's tackle the traits of the uh, healthy family. Uh, interviewed all these people who are working in, with families all the time. What's the number one thing you came up Communicates with? Communicates and listens. But the number one question families will ask is, how do we know? How do we know if we're communicating compared to what? Well, that's what I wanted to say. I, said, well, I want you to define those sure. terms. What do you mean by communication? Yeah. What do you mean in a family situation by listening? Right. Well, one of the things I did then, by the way, was when, when that came up, I decided to go into families that were pinpointed as healthy to me by these same professionals, 500 of them. I didn't go into 500 families and studied what's going on inside a communicating family that may not be going in, on inside other families. And then I came up with nine characteristics and that's the bulk of the book. So it gives families some way of testing. And just to, to mention a few, the mm -hmm. number one is a balance of power between spouses. No dominant subordinate relationship. Mm -hmm. I asked children separately, who's boss in your family? And the more communicative the family, the more apt the children were to say, sometimes mom, sometimes dad, or neither mom or dad or both. And, and in, in the subordinate, the imbalance of power, inevitably those children would say mom or dad. By no means, by the way, is the man always dominant person. Is it uh, something that has been uh, worked out in advance by the couples or is it something that's evolved? Oh, it's involved. Evolved. And, and it's, it's something that where they see each other as full persons. There's not that Archie Edith Bunker kind of thing that, right. remember Archie's famous word when you want to see its relationship to communication, when Edith would start to share a feeling or disagree and she'd say, but Archie, I think, do you remember what he'd say? Stifle yourself. Stifle yourself. Yeah. Another, another hallmark of communication is this family pays more attention to nonverbal communication. How do they do that? Silence. Um, touching, 
uh, feelings. Not feelings. By say, by say, uh, they pay more attention to it. You mean they're more actively involved? Right, in right. They they sense when someone comes home from work or school that the day hasn't gone well. Uh huh. They they sense when someone's self-esteem is low. In other words, really, we we judge we we open our feelings through nonverbal communication. A teenager slams the door, we know, <laughs> or yeah, turns yeah. up the music. The teenager doesn't say, I don't want to listen to you anymore, parent. He turns up the music. Let me get the folks at home okay. involved in the conversation. Dolores Curran is our guest. She's syndicated in papers all over the country with her column. Uh, she has written a book called Traits of a Healthy Family. It's now available in paperback. We're talking about families and what makes uh, the healthy ones seem to work. Your questions are invited. 313 in Detroit, 872-4040. Jump on the telephone. I think that's the one common denominator we all have. Not jumping on telephones, friends. <laughs> uh, we all have families. And uh, you might like to know if yours is moving along in the right direction. Uh, there are 15 traits, and I want you to rattle some of them off in okay. a minute. But sometimes uh, you can have three or four of the traits, or five or six. You don't have all 15, no. right? Run some of them down okay. so people Let's can. Let's run through them fast. And, and then, then I want to go back okay. to the communication and listening. Communication and listening. Secondly, a healthy family affirms and supports. The third, respect. Respects one another. Teaches respect. Individual differences and all. The fourth, trust. Terribly important. The fifth, the sense of play and humor. Yeah. The sixth, more common in single parent families, a sense of shared responsibility. Seventh, teaches right from wrong. Eighth, my favorite. Um, has um, a strong sense of family with lots of traditions. What do you mean by that? Oh, it, traditions are the bonding in families. They have they have things that bond them together. Um, uh, uh, traditions are so important that the first major argument many many couples have their first year of marriage is over Christmas. Oh, where we're gonna go? Where we're gonna go? How do we, we open the gifts on yeah. Christmas Eve, Christmas right, morning? Do we go to midnight mass. And you'll say to them. If I, they do not remember that pleasurably, and you'll say to them five years later, why? You're intelligent. Why was this so important? And they'll say, because that's the way it was supposed to be. Uh -huh. And a good, healthy couple will drop some, add some, take some from each side, and that's what makes them unique as a couple. Uh, new traditions. Right. Okay, now after traditions, what do you got? Ninth is a balance of interaction. And, and the big offender there in the American family is the absent father, the workaholic father. And the tenth is a shared religious core, but not necessarily denominational core. You can have a strong interfaith marriage. Mm -hmm. The eleventh respects privacy of one another. Twelfth values service to others, but keeps your volunteerism under control. Thirteenth is one that surprised me most: fosters table time and conversation. Why the professionals would pick that out of 56 traits as such a high trait? Table it's, time. It really? means that the family dinner table is under siege, and many families today are not eating together at all, and and so they can't communicate when they you want. You together. personally want to ban television during no, meals, well, right? during meals. During meals. But, but television is can be a very useful bonding. Uh, vehicle in the family, so I don't want to ban it. No, no I said but ban during, during meals. meals. I do, I Absolutely. really do. Absolutely, and I think that's you healthy. Can't, you you can't, can't talk, you, you gotta share. You can't converse, and that's the traditional one time a day families are together. You said you had in your house flop time, where somebody <laughs> come in, just hang out on the bed and well, share the day. Well, there are times in family when there's part time jobs and high school sports and all this that you can't have eating time together. So you find some other time. I said some families find breakfast, and that's a horrible thought for us because we aren't very pleasant in the morning. But before bedtime, it seemed like all the kids would come in and flop out. We have three. And yeah. we they kind of would all, we'd all go through the day. Mm -hmm. You need that because it keeps you current with what's going on in each other's lives. Okay, we were down toward like 14. 14 and Shares 15. leisure time, but not all leisure time. And the last one, the biggest change in one generation, healthy family expects problems, admits to problems, and seeks help. Okay, let's go backwards now. We talked a little bit about communication. Uh, we'll pick out some of the others as we go along. Okay. Uh, and I'm sure the folks at home will raise them. Uh, listening. What does it mean in a family to listen? Okay. Maybe you can tie that into the second one, which has to do with affirming and supporting, and supporting. each other. And really, these are all intertwined. And the yeah. interesting thing is that many of them are traditional kinds of values, too, that we, we families are trying to retain. Um, there's, there's two kinds of listening. You can listen reactively, which most of us do in, when we, we're listening emotionally. We react when our children tell us something. And then we back up and ask them 
questions. Or you can listen responsively. And responsively means listening to the feelings behind the words. And, and you find in healthy families they tend to listen responsively. When the child comes home and the mother says, what's wrong, and he says, nothing, she knows mm -hmm. that, that there's something wrong. Because if there isn't, he would say nothing. Why? I mean, it's, there's a, you, you learn how to listen when your spouse gives a response. You can, you can sense the feelings behind mm -hmm. that response. It's like a child who says, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. But, but listening is an art, and we aren't taught as parents how to listen. And this is one thing we can learn. That's why with, with some families who feel that they may not be good families, sometimes they're excellent listeners. Mm -hmm. And we say, okay, there's your strength. Now, when your stresses come up, you reach for that strength. Another family may not be good listeners, but have strong sense of shared responsibility. I like that idea about uh, you know affirming the uh, and supporting each other. Mm. Uh, really, that's what uh, propping each other up that's and right. encouraging them. And uh, I have a friend of mine who says that uh, people should uh, be building bridges. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many times, those who, people who are close to us were, were digging ditches in front of them, uh, good and point. and were, were were tearing down their identity. Were 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 were, were under. Uh -huh. Were cutting them down instead of, you know, supporting them to and do their best. It's really beautiful to go in and look at these families where they're all supporting one another. In some families that they don't do that, the mom becomes the chief support system. She supports the husband and the children, and nobody supports her. Mm -hmm. Or um, support is only granted when somebody has achieved something. Mm -hmm. You know, you really, when do you need support more? When is when you have, yeah, 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 when you're struggling. Uh, Dolores Curran is our guest, 313 in Detroit, 872-4040. You might have a family that you're attached to. You might have some <laughs> questions as to how it's functioning. Jump on the telephone. It'll be all fair game. Dolores knows from when she speaks. She's been in this uh, parenting and uh, family expert business for a long time, conducts seminars all over the country, writes about it. So she has some answers that you might uh, take advantage of her time. Hi there. You're on Late Night America. Yes, this is Gladys. Hi, Gladys. From Georgia. Go ahead. I would like to ask her, do you feel that the current children of divorce will have a healthier family life or not? Depends on the children. One of the things I found in my research is that you can have a healthy family if you're a single parent. We've got to do away with that myth that all dual parent families are better than any single parent family. If these relationships are evident within the single parent family, you can have healthy children. And, and many, many fam single parent families are healthy if they've got their communication, trust, respect, and so on in order. Okay. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Uh, this is Paul, Superior, Wisconsin. Hi, Paul. Uh, as a grandparent, I'm kind of interested in, uh, in the aspect. Uh, I wonder in the last generation or two if you've seen a change in the relationships between grandparents and grandchildren. And what I'm referring to especially is the way it used to be when uh, grandparents uh, lived in the home. Mm -hmm. Now they go to nursing homes or high-rise apartments or so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, they used to live in the home. And I, I remember some unpleasant experiences uh, by having grandparents in the home. And I just wonder if you have any information or any comment on that. Thank you, Paul. I think the biggest issue there, and, and it's a good question, I believe, because a lot of people are struggling with it, is, is distance today. You remember unpleasant experiences, but I'm sure you remember some pleasant experiences as well with grandparents. Um, it's unfortunate today in our mobile society that many children grow up without knowing their grandparents well. And, um, and that's, that's, I don't see the response to that other than, uh, again, healthy families tend to have a strong sense of family and kinship. They, they try to uh, meet for reunions, they tell stories, they share rituals. So even though they may not have the closeness in physical proximity, many times they, they know their grandparents through their parents talking about them. Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Yes, this is Brian calling from Detroit. Hi Brian. Yes, I would like to ask a question. What would be your advice to a child 
who comes from a broken family, a mother, a drug addicted mother, a drug addicted father, and yet the home that the child is living in, his parental grandparent, tries to raise the child to the best that she can, and yet she may fail in some areas. What would be your advice on that? We all fail in some areas. That's a lucky child to have that grandparent under the circumstances. I've seen magnificent grandparents doing the job of parenting. Uh, I don't know if that's your situation, but hang in there because that's a lucky child. You know, when uh, let's take the take the case put right on the table here, because this is a uh, person uh, shows concern because uh, father, mother, drug, uh, uh, grandparents get involved. You know, when they talk about uh, showing a child love, what does this mean? I mean, yeah. what what is? I mean, what I'm trying to get to is, can you? I mean. Nobody's perfect and everybody's going to make mistakes, but what's the big thing that those grandparents are going to put out toward that trust. child? The, ch the, the child needs an adult in which he can trust with a certain predictability. And he knows that those, may, he, he can't trust his parents anymore with, with predictability. Mm -hmm. But if there's some adult in his life, and it can be a grandparent, it can be an aunt, it can be a neighbor, whoever it is, he, that he knows, cares enough about him to, to uh, give him some direction and some care, then he can grow up with trust and love. Mm, that's it. Hi there. You're on Late Night America. Yes, this is Johnny Bell from Atlanta, Georgia. Hi. Uh, my husband's totally disabled, and I have a 13-year-old daughter that uh, has lupus. Mm. And my problem is with my older children. I had some a lot older than my little one. And uh, every time they get in a fight with their spouses, they want to come home. And uh, they stay two or three days, and they get us all upset. And then they make up and kiss and make up, and they go back to where they was to start with. And it just keeps my home in an uproar all the time, because this happens like every week or two, you know, with one of the two of them. And I just wonder how, what I can do to make them understand that I've got my hands full and I don't need them. Good. We're so glad you called. Um, I, I really missed a word in there that I didn't understand who was doing the fighting with the 13-year-old. Well, the, the older children come, come from, back their, home. from their marriages, right, and come, come home and creates an uproar in the house. Oh, well, that... How, how does she say, I love you, but you can't come in here and do that? She says that. She says that? She says that. She says, um, you know, I love to have you, and when you can come in and, and create this family as a pleasurable place to be, please come. But they're obviously having problems in their own or, situations. Or it sounds as if, too, that they may be having some problems relating to the 13-year-old and, and maybe some envy, I don't know. But, but a 13-year-old who has lupus is, first of all, under, a 13-year-old is going through her own problems anyway. And with lupus, and, and the mother is obviously dealing with that. And then having older ones come in, and it, it's, it's creating all kinds of tension. And I think that the mother is very right. You just simply deal with it. These older children are adults and you deal with them as adults and you say hey I love to have you home because I love you and you're wonderful to have around and as long as you're wonderful to have around and come home but I wouldn't hesitate when they came home and started saying uh, creating a problem saying I think it's time that you leave now hi there you're on Late Night America yes my name is Gary from Buffalo New York hi hi um, my husband has two children from previous marriage mm -hmm. and uh, the mother doesn't want to see them. She asked for visitation rights when my husband had taken her to court for support just for their college education so he could put the money away. And uh, the, the visitation rights didn't work out at all. Now she said that she couldn't compete with me in the field of mothering, I guess, and doesn't want to see him anymore. And how do I explain to them that she doesn't want to be with them? Mm. Well, I don't think you can. I think it's going to have to be up. How old are the children? Oh, I, we're not on. No, sure we are. are we? How old are the kids? They're 10 and 8, and I just had two of my own within the past two years. Okay, well, you really have two generations at home, right? Okay. Um, you, um, I think, for one thing, is that it's not your issue. It's your husband's issue. And secondly, that at this point, I would be very reluctant to say to the children, your mother doesn't want to see you again, but very soon, you're going to have to say that maybe in a couple of years. And I wouldn't hedge. Um, there, if, 
w one of the problems with trust that we were talking about earlier is that if you say to the kids, well, your mother would like to see you, but she can't, and you make, we make up all kinds of elaborate fiction here, the children then don't trust us because they sense that already. And, and one of the things I would, I would be very frank with them and say, right now your mother doesn't seem able to, to contact you or be able to see you, but in, I would keep the contact open right to her, and if in a f couple of years she wants to, you kept the door open. That must be tremendously devastating to a child, and I think as, uh, as, as uh, you know, adults were afraid of putting that right on the table, that it will just oh, crush them. Absolutely, and they know more than we do, than we think they know about it. Another thing, by the way, is that by 1990, the major child in America will be a stepchild, by 1990. The majority of children in America. Ooh, so we exactly. yes. So we really need to be um, dealing, learning to deal more with this step parenting and step childing. <laughs> Hi there, you're on Late Night America. Um, yes, this is Kathy from uh, Washington, Michigan. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Um, I was uh, a single mother for about eight years, and I had a son that was about 11 or 12, which are real formative years, and. Um, uh, he grew distant at that time because I was trying to work and raise him as a, you know, single parent. I have other two, two other children, 12 and 9 now, but they were little still. Um, as we, as they grew older, you know, the son, I was uh, seeing someone else and he resented that. Um, now he's 18 and he's still really, really distant to me and now my, my, now my husband. And I was wondering, is there ever any time that he would ever come back into yeah. the fold or, oh. or will he always sure. remain this distant? No. Good question. No. Um, first of all, uh, uh, something you said there, I pick up in single parents I work with all the time. My son was, was distant to me and sullen, or however you put it, because I was a single parent. He would have been the same way, chances are, if you had been a dual parent. Uh, 11, 12-year-old mm -hmm. sons. We could talk all night about 11, 12-year-old sons. Uh, the, the, the point is, too, and I don't know from what you're calling on, on his relationship with his own father, but a lot of times, if there's still anger at this age, much of it is against the father, but you are the one that inherits it because you're there. If you can tough it through... Uh,